My song is love unknown, my Savior's love to me, love to the loveless shown that they might lovely be. Oh, who am I that for my sake my Lord should take fail fresh and die. He came from heaven's throne, salvation to bestow. The world that was his own would not it save. My friend indeed, who at my need his life did spend. Here might I stay and sing, no story so divine, never was love dear king, never was grief like mine. This is my friend in whose sweet praise I all my days could gladly spend. For any Christian church, Gathering together for prayer and worship grows out of our shared faith in the author of life, who is Jesus Christ. But believers cannot build a church that only gathers for prayer and song and only nourishes themselves with the word of God. We are learning in these weeks after Easter through the experiences of those earliest congregations in Jerusalem, that building a church requires a level of boldness that comes not from within themselves, but from God's Holy Spirit. It's a boldness to speak and to act. It's a boldness that can be met by the powers that be with anger or violence, or attempts to control the spreading of information that they don't want other people to hear. Look at what happens in our text from this morning. Peter and John, they speak boldly about the power of Christ to those religious authorities. And I remind all of you at home that our text for today is Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 22, if you want to look it up. You might remember from last week that Peter had been preaching in the temple with the man who had been born unable to walk, now standing next to he and John because of the healing power of the name of Jesus. The powers that be, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees, who were a part of the influential priestly establishment in Jerusalem, had been alerted to what was going on. They also did not miss the obvious fact that a lot of people had gathered to listen to Peter. So many, in fact, that Luke reports to us that 5,000 people believed the word that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. That's a pretty big crowd, 5,000. Convincing people that someone had been actually resurrected from the dead did not sit well with the Sadducees. They did not believe that resurrection fit anywhere with the Torah, not in any of the teachings of Moses, which they followed religiously. They understood, you see, that the best way for someone to connect with God was to follow the teachings of Moses, period. Not to believe in some guy who was resurrected from the dead, or so they say. 
This is important to understand because the Sadducees were among the religious and social elites of their time, and therefore they are the ones with the power to judge for or against any upstart group of believers. They vehemently oppose the apostles, their message, and their practices throughout the whole book of Acts. So the Sadducees' response to what Peter and John had done, like many of those in authority, when their authority is challenged or undermined or ridiculed in some way, they clamp down and they did what they could to stop this dangerous behavior. So they arrested Peter and John and they threw them in jail for the night. And the next morning, they brought the two apostles in before this tribunal of religious authorities, and they were questioned. Just what do you think you are doing? Just what kind of authority do you have to heal a man who never walked before? Already, we are seeing that these followers of Jesus end up facing similar kinds of resistance to that which was faced by Jesus. Remember Jesus in front of Caiaphas, in front of Herod, in front of Pontius Pilate? You see, those who want to build a church cannot expect to get off more easily than Jesus did. If we're going to live our lives with the same commitment to loving others, to seeking justice, and to promoting peace, then we also run the risk of raising the hackles of the powers that be, wherever we are. In Baltimore, Maryland, United States of America, we are very unlikely to lose our lives for speaking out, but we sure do know what it's like to run into walls erected by systems in our society today. There's that elusive shopping center owner who seems to care so little for the safety of the people who frequent his property. There's those practical and attitudinal roadblocks that are put up against recently released prisoners who are trying to find a job there's that power of tradition in a church that keeps newer members from speaking up about their ideas and their suggestions. You see, it's because of this Jesus disturbance. That's what William Willimon calls the ministry of Jesus, the Jesus disturbance. It's because of that that those with the authority to judge feel threatened wherever we might be. Peter speaks very boldly, very wisely, very convincingly. The authorities are stunned that this uneducated, ordinary fisherman could speak so well and make them look bad in the eyes of the crowd for arresting John and Peter in the first place. Peter's boldness comes from the Holy Spirit. He's very clear that this outlandish charge of healing a man who never walked before has nothing to do with his own ability or his own actions. He gives all the credit to Jesus the Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, who was sentenced to die at the hands of the very same kind of authorities who are looking down at Peter at that very moment. The authorities, I can imagine, are looking back and forth between that man who was just healed and this crowd of onlookers who are gathered outside. They don't know what to say. Their only response then is to order that they have a time for executive session. And they sent Peter and John out of the room so they could debate about what to do 
in response to what Peter was saying. They knew very well that this crowd of people believed that the healing had been in the name of Jesus and that the preaching of the good news of the resurrection had now convinced many of them to be believers in Christ. Given the pressure of the crowd, you see, they could not detain Peter and John any longer, nor could they really punish them physically. So instead, they called them back into the room and they ordered them to not speak or teach in the name of Jesus. Kind of reminds me of what happened to our brothers and sisters in Cuba. One set of abusive authorities was toppled and a new regime took over in 1959. Under Fidel Castro, the church was looked at as totally invalid. The church lost all its power and many of its resources. The church schools that were so common in that time were closed and turned into government schools. The church buildings that housed mini pharmacies and food pantries, as well as spaces for worship and study, were forced to be abandoned. The powers that be in Cuba basically tried to put a muzzle on the church, tried to control the kind of information that was available to the people by controlling the media, and by bad-mouthing religious institutions. Essentially, they tried to ban belief. But you can't do that, can you? It doesn't work. On the outside, to other people watching, Castro may have claimed that he was in control, that the church was muzzled for good. It was not necessary anymore for the community. But the truth of a resurrected Jesus cannot be contained or muzzled. In Cuba, the gospel continued underground for several decades with believers meeting in homes, in small connect groups. Those Christians who had to publicly renounce their roles in the church in order to keep their jobs continued still to believe in their hearts that Christ is the author of life. No government official could take that belief away. Now we know that the worshiping communities are permitted to gather in Cuba again, although that government still continues to maintain a very close watch on the actions and activities of the churches. Peter boldly replies to those religious leaders who are trying to shush he and John. We can absolutely not stop speaking about what we've seen and heard. If that's not defiance in the face of authority, I don't know what is. They had just said to him, you will not speak or teach in this name of Jesus. And they said, we will not stop teaching and speaking. But at this point, you see, Peter knew very well that he and John had the upper hand in this situation. There were too many people who had heard and believed too many people who knew that arresting someone for healing in Christ's name was bogus. We see this dynamic at play in our day and time again and again. Civil authorities and maybe sometimes even religious authorities, drunk on the wine of self-importance or white privilege or conspicuous consumption, overstep their power, passing judgment on those with no power, with no money, with no social capital. Too often they get away with it in a system that still is skewed 
to those in power. This past week, we saw an authority figure toppled, getting the verdict he deserved for killing a man with his knee. Maybe the Minneapolis decision gives us a glimmer of hope that change is a coming. The followers of Jesus in Peter's day and now have no reason to expect that the powers that be will have any more interest in them or any more support for them than they did for Jesus himself bucking up against authorities who are on the wrong side of justice is gonna bring a reaction. And often a swift, angry, negative reaction. That's why standing firm in what you believe requires boldness. Not boldness that comes from being a courageous individual, but boldness that comes from being together with a community of believers who are inspired and equipped by the Holy Spirit. We didn't hear this part of the text this morning, but if you read on in chapter 4, let me tell you what happened. After Peter and John were released that day from the auspices of the authorities, they went to the group of believers to tell them what had happened. The group prayed together. And it's significant about what they prayed. They didn't ask God for protection from these religious authorities out of fear that they too would be arrested. That's not what they were praying. They prayed for boldness. They prayed for God to give them boldness that they would need to continue to speak God's word in the face of persecution or discrimination or bogus charges or threats. They clearly believe that even in the face of persecution by powerful people, they could turn to God. They believe that they were still in God's hands and so are the poor, the disenfranchised, the vulnerable, those on the margins. They are still in God's hands. We are still in God's hands. Even in the face of unmerited troubles and trials, God's hand never wavers. Yes, indeed, my friends. Church building requires boldness. The external community outside, our neighbors, need to hear and to see what we are about. Otherwise, they might mistake us for just another fun-loving social group of some sort. You know, like kind of like a Ravens fan club or a gardening group or the players on a softball team who get together after the game. But we're different. We are different. We're a community who shares faith in the author of life. And together, we're witnesses to justice. We're doing random acts of kindness. And we're walking side by side with those who are hurting or homeless or haunted by demons or addiction. Let us be church builders, bold and strong, ready to exhibit the love of Jesus Christ in this world in which we live. Amen. You may put your prayers in the chat at this time. <laughs>